Hello and welcome to UAT Time within the United Countries special by First Ukraine. You can find us at the frequencies available at our website firstua.com. I'm Sergei Vilichansky. And I am Olivier Vedrin. UAT Time is dedicated to bring Ukraine and Europe closer to each other by introducing the real Ukraine to the rest of the world. For the past year or so, Ukraine has been on news all over the world. The reports were not always good and definitely not always positive for the Ukrainian image. It is all due to the media coverage and unfortunately not a correct one. Different media tries to reach different goals, so it is very important that media agencies try to keep the needed balance as they cover the ongoing events. Our guest today is Peter Dickinson, a chef editor of Business Ukraine magazine, which is a monthly English language publication covering Ukrainian business, politics, society and lifestyle news. It was established in 2007 and is independently owned. Welcome. Welcome, Peter. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, UA Tea Time, that's a weekly program. and. Uh, uh, we always, with Olivier, are trying to invite uh, people that um, that are concerned about what is going on in, in Ukraine. But let me start first with the question. The magazine is Business Ukraine, but it's not only about business. And it's, you started in 2007. Would you please give us an idea how in the world you got into the position of starting the media here and how have you been doing? Um, well, thank you very much for, for inviting me, first of all. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the magazine began in 2007, as you say. My background in Ukraine goes back further than that to the late 1990s. Uh, like a lot of foreigners who live here, I came for a short time and ended up staying for a long time. <laughs> um, it's, it's a common story. My, I was originally here for one year with the British Embassy. I was representing the British Council in the west of Ukraine. Um, then I came to Kiev, and when the time came to move on, uh, I was so taken by Ukraine that I stayed on here. I decided to, to give it another, say, year, perhaps, and then one year became two, became three. Uh, I'm now married here. I have a family here. I'm very settled here. I consider Kiev to be my home, uh, and I'm, I feel very strongly that Ukraine deserves a fairer hearing in the international community, and perhaps most of all, uh, needs to be understood. I think that the, the, the key problem that Ukraine faces is not so much uh, negative information, it's a lack of information altogether. So um, what I try to do with Business Ukraine is to provide an insight, uh, a bridge where foreigners either living here, visiting here or, or internationally on the, via the internet uh, can learn more about the country, can learn more about the business community, the business environment, also the political environment, the geopolitical environment, uh, the historical context and social issues, lifestyle issues, mm -hmm. you know, pop, pop culture, as it were, so that they can feel that this is not such a, such a strange or distant place. Uh, I think, Olivier, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, while there are uh, international uh, publications like this and Kyiv Post and others, mm -hmm. uh, there is still a chance for Ukraine. Honestly, mm -hmm. that's what I think. Mm. It has to do with freedom. Yes, yes, definitely. But you know, uh, in Ukraine, you don't have problem with press freedom. I don't feel that now. Now, um, well, I would say if you, if if you take a comparative approach and compare Ukraine to the rest of the former Soviet Union, I would say definitely Ukraine is a leader in terms of press freedoms. Yeah. If you compare Ukraine to some West European countries or, or other parts of the developing world, I think it still has some distance to go. Uh, but. Perhaps the only fair comparison is with other countries with a similar background. And so if you look at the, the CIS region or the post-Soviet region, I think clearly Ukraine is, is, a, is a guiding light. They've made enormous achievements in freeing up the press. Uh, I think one of the issues that's important to stress here is that there were a lot of misconceptions. If we go back to the time of the Orange Revolution, there were a lot of misconceptions that free press meant honest press or mm -hmm. objective press, mm -hmm. whereas in reality free press means free of government control. Uh, so in Ukraine, we have a situation where there is a, a significant freedom from government control. There are, there are issues, there are licensing issues, there are various um, specific flashpoints, but in general, it is free of that. But of course, owners of media holdings, of channels and of media platforms will have their, 
their positions to defend. I I'm totally agree with you. If you if you go to Russia, Azerbaijan, or Kazakhstan, it's very different. Press oh. freedom yes. really <laughs> doesn't exist. But here uh, in Ukraine, maybe because Ukraine is really on the road and closer for the European Union, maybe, yes, we have more press freedom, and that's very very good. And but you are, you don't have only a business magazine. You have other another magazine in Lviv, yeah. Yes, we also publish Lviv Today, which is a more of a lifestyle publication in West Ukraine, um, more geared towards tourist audiences. Um, Lviv obviously being arguably the most attractive city in terms of tourism in Ukraine today. Uh, it's been, uh, that's been running for now seven years, and I, I would say that it's, it's less business and uh, current affairs orientated, although we do also work with the local business community and try to promote business opportunities there. And as a specialist of media, um, what is your analysis about the future of media in Ukraine? What do you think about the future of media in Ukraine, what, TV, media or newspaper? Um, well, I think in, in, in very broad terms, I think it's going to be similar to, you know, in terms of print media, then obviously things, everything's moving towards an online model. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the interesting things we will see a lot more of in the coming years, and we're already seeing now, is uh, very high level and ambitious Russian media figures, so yes. prof top professionals from Russia, coming here because they're able to practice their trade here. I mean, we already have a number of uh, very high-profile people who are here running. I, um, without naming names, there's, I can think of five or six very prominent TV personalities, um, magazine editors, uh, internet innovators who have come to Ukraine and I've actually recently read a number of articles about this from the Russian media and the, the, the very small independent Russian media where they've highlighted this that prof top professionals from Russia will, you know, Ukraine will become a, <clears throat> a haven for the very best of Russian journalism because this is a place where they can actually practice their trade whereas obviously in Russia today there is no real, in, you know, there is no such profession as journalism really. It's become, no. it's become by, by uh, by the admission of the Russian authorities, journalists are now members of the of the military, essentially. Do you think that uh, maybe Kiev will become like London during the Second World War, a capital of freedom? <laughs> yes, perhaps. Um, I think within within the within the, the former Soviet world, which I, I don't think Ukraine needs to reject its membership of the former Soviet world. I think that's what Ukraine, you know, Ukraine is part of that world. So. Uh, in that context, I think definitely yes. I mean, if you look at the the former Soviet sphere, uh, a number. If we look at these initiatives from Russia, a number of initiatives are currently based in the Baltic states. Um, but realistically, the Baltic states are very small. They don't offer the kind of commercial appeal that Ukraine can offer. I mean, Ukrainian a successful Ukrainian media outlet on a national scale is a major. It could be a major figure. I mean, it can be a major player. We're talking about a 40, 40 plus million audience here in Ukraine. Mm -hmm which can also then expand beyond. I mean, I think the Russian market obviously will be to an extent closed to them, but there are the other former Soviet republics, there are the Baltics themselves, there are the Central Asian republics, the Caucasus, and of course the huge Russian language, uh, Russian-speaking diaspora all over the world. Yeah. Uh, I want to come back to one statement that you have just made. Uh, as a Ukrainian, I have some sort of a contradiction in my mind because um, when you say that uh, free media is not necessarily an honest media, freedom versus honesty. Um, so what are we striving for? A, a, a really free media that can say anything about anyone or a media that is somewhat uh, is faithful to their, you know, uh, pledge of being a journalist, you know? Well, no media is free in the sense that anyone can say anything. No, that's not the case in England, it's not the case in France, I'm sure it's not the case in America, there are laws. It, well, a free media needs to be a media governed by a set of clear laws and legislation which are equal for everybody. So defamation laws, slander laws, uh, etc. So you can't go out and make wild claims about individuals and slander their reputations in the media. So it's not free in that sense. You can't incite hatred in a lot of countries. Um, you can't call for, you can't make statements of a racist or sexist or uh, homophobic character. You know, so there are restrictions in mm -hmm. place, but they are, um, they are 
applicable to everyone. I think the point I would make is, and the key distinction for me between where Ukraine was, say, 15 years ago in the, in the Kuchma era, where Russia is today, where a lot of the former Soviet republics remain, is the, is, the, is the role of government influence. So it's specifically free, when we talk about free media, we're essentially talking about free of undue or direct government influence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with this point of view. And during the Yanukovych period, that was very, very difficult to us, some free information. And, uh, but because of a lot of, lot of things changed, really. I am, more, I am like you, very positive for the future. Well, I, I would take it back. Even, I, would go, I think it's, it, it swings in different directions. So I would take it back to the Orange Revolution time. I think before the Orange Revolution, there was a situation in Ukraine which was in many respects comparable or similar to the situation in today's Russia. Uh, the Orange Revolution was a watershed in that sense. In many ways, the freeing of the media was one of the only concrete achievements that actually was able to take root after True. that. Mm -hmm. um, we, had a, we had a deluge of uh, chat shows and political talk shows. Yeah. And I think there was a slight backlash because some in the public, people got a bit exhausted from hearing all these terrible things said all the time, <laughs> which had been <laughs> hidden from them. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so there was, there was slight frustration in that sense. But in, in the general sense, it was a great period of, of opening up. The, the advent of the Yanukovych regime in 2010 saw that swinging again in the other yeah. direction. Um, there were obvious changes in editorial policy and a yeah. lot of the a lot of the newspapers but it wasn't a complete return no but it, a part a part a part yeah, but the they re never achieved the complete return no, to no. to where they'd been before the Orange revolution and i think we saw that during euromaidan that the channels were you know some of the channels were widely criticized for being but censored during you know. euromaidan a lot of lot of media appeared like uh, Spino TV, like a uh, lot of new media appeared. Yes, a lot of a lot of a lot of startup media. Yeah, I would say, you know, startup like, like media. <laughs> Kromatsky startup obviously media. would be the would be for me the most prominent of, yeah. of them, um, which I think that they they played an important role. But mainstream media did as well. I mean, if we look at the the the, the mainstream national channels, again, most of them I think also they they didn't ignore the the, the events. Some of them had a very slanted approach, uh, which you could criticize, I think you could justifiably criticize, but if these events had taken place in Russia or in another of the former Soviet republics, it's very likely they wouldn't have been on TV at all. And there would have been a total mm -hmm. silence, mm -hmm. uh, which is, again, coming back to my point, that's where the freedom comes. So this freedom is very difficult to take back once people have experienced it. Yes, and, yes. And, and it, it, there's a lot of resistance to that. And I think this is, um, for me, one of the most powerful, to take, take, again, to go back to the Orange Revolution, one of the most powerful uh, symbolic moments of that whole time was when the, uh, if, if you recall, the, the, they were in the first few days of the protest when a lot of the channels were not showing them mm -hmm. or were downplaying them or attempting to portray them as extremists. The, they had a, an evening uh, news bulletin with a sign language person who was giving sign language for deaf audiences. And while they were reading out the, the, the falsified results of the election, the sign language, uh, what do you call it, the signer, was giving the symbol saying, don't believe this, it's not true, they're lying to you. <laughs> and of course, no one in the television understood what she was saying, so they broadcast it. And the, so the deaf people of Ukraine were the first to hear Mm. of the truth, which I thought wow. was beautiful, beautifully poignant and symbolic, uh, Assembly, yeah. symbolic, moment. Yeah. symbolic moment. With, um, again, uh, probably a year and a half uh, that's been this long when uh, all of the world is hearing, you know, about Ukraine on the news. Uh, after Maidan, then the Crimea and, uh, uh, annex, uh, Crimea annexation and uh, and then the war in Donbass. But uh, the greatest test for the journalism, I think, right now, is that um, there have been used a lot of new strategies and technologies in the informational war. And I believe that uh, this is a, quite a challenge right now for, for the journalists, because some, in some way they need to take which part they're on, which side they're you know, on. Um, what do you think? How difficult is for you to maintain the balance? Well, one of the key uh, one of the key um, rules of all Western journalism is object objectivity, and to show both sides, or in many cases, all sides of any issue. Um, so to be outside of it and to absolutely, at all costs, avoid uh, any judgments. So. 
I think Russia has very skillfully exploited this, exploited this desire to appear objective. So um, they've, they've been well aware that the Western media is obliged to repeat their positions, even if they know full well that the positions are, are ludicrous, are, are you know, self-evidently false. So if you talk to Western journalists, they very often say, you know, you talk to a journalist, for example, take, take the Crimea, the annexation of Crimea, for example, and, and the little green men. Uh, if you talk to journalists there, as I've done on many occasions, you know, they'll often tell you, you know, you say, you reported that we don't know who these people are. They may be this. Ukraine says it's Russian soldiers. Russia denies it. I said, mm -hmm. well, you're there. Were you, were you unsure? Did you not know? And he said, no, of course we knew. So why didn't you report it? He said, well, we were told by our offices, do you know 100%? Have you got the, the proof in your hands that these people are Russians? No, I don't. Therefore, you have to present it. He said this, they said that. Mm -hmm. And so this has been, that's essentially, I mean, people have been very, I think, perhaps overly complimentary to Russia in terms of the, the innovativeness of this information war. That's yes. basically it. They're basically saying, OK, the Western media has to put our point of view across. And they've exploited that. That's very, very well. important. Yeah. Because for me, the Western media are a victim of the Russian propaganda, manipulation, you know? Yes. Uh, uh, totally manipulated. Yes. Uh, because of our kindness, because of our professionalism in Western, uh, in Western media, we want to say everything and we want to be right 100%. Yeah. And we prefer to say nothing than to say something wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we were manipulated with that. And for me, really, uh, now the, the newspaper or the Western European media are under a manipulation. Well, I think there's a, there's a backlash to this now we're seeing. Um, that, that's definitely true. I'd agree, I'd agree 100%. I'm not sure if we could call the Western media nice, <laughs> to be honest. That's perhaps, I would probably choose a different word. But certainly kind, they, kind. Well, I think, I think cautious, I would say, to be honest. I would say cautious. Um, but I think... The, Sometimes overly cautious. Yes, I think, I think often overly cautious. I think this is a good example where we see they are overly cautious. But um, we are seeing a bit of a backlash to that now. Um, a number of media outlets <clears throat> have recently, well, recently within the past, say, in the past, say, half year of the conflict, have been much more aggressively pursuing Russian Russian fake news, Russian denials, Russian lies, whereas in the beginning they were quite cautious of doing that because they felt that they would then have, somehow be taking sides. Um, so I think that there is, there are, there are, it moves slowly, you know, things move very slowly in democracies. Yeah. Mon monarchies are not dictatorships, no one at the top saying, do it. So but it takes time, but we are seeing a slight change. Isn't that why uh, they didn't um, take sides, because they didn't want to bring harm? I think that's one of the main, uh, to, to anybody, if, if, if the news or the information is not 100% uh, uh, proven, mm. they, they, as you said, they, they'd rather not say anything, yeah. ju basically because there is a guideline, do not harm anybody with any fake uh, news or any fake information. Yeah, I think certainly. I, well, I think the first, the first person they don't want to harm is themselves, frankly. I think it's their, their own <laughs> reputation. Yeah. So Lawsuits this, is, this, stuff, is, this yeah. is the key. But also, I think we, we, we shouldn't overestimate the emotional engagement of Western media in what's happening in Ukraine. For them, Ukraine is a very distant place. It's yes. not known to them. Um, I think if you want to try and understand it, imagine how, you know, your feelings perhaps towards what's happening in Burma or Myanmar yes, or Syria. Exactly. Okay, these are these are also human tragedies of, of great importance, but they might not necessarily touch audiences here because they're very distant. Uh, so I think we shouldn't overestimate how engaged the West, the Western audiences are, and the Western media are. But also, um, in terms of you know why do they do it? I think it's caution. It's it's a, mm. it's a desire not to be caught out, not to be trapped. And also, if we look at the Russian strategy. Um, the whole narrative of a fascist Ukraine, a right-wing Ukraine, an extremist Ukraine, that's partly for Russian audiences to justify what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But it's also a very effective tool for Western audiences because it makes Westerners say, do we want to associate with this? Because there's nothing worse in a Western yes, audience than, yes. than, than the Nazis. Extremism, so that's yeah. the ultimate taboo. And we can see this by the way the Russians have used the anti-Semitism theme. Um, 
to the best of my knowledge, Russia is not particularly concerned about anti-Semitism. Um, they have a, a lot of very openly anti-Semitic commentaries on Russian television, so I don't believe that they're sincere in this position. But they've used it relentlessly, uh, despite the fact that Jewish communities here have said, we don't feel under threat. Yeah purely because they know in Western, in the Western world this rings very loud and Westerners will say, oh wow, anti-Semites, we don't want to associate with them. So yes, exactly. in a way it encourages the distancing. But I think also we you really, Europe, you know, Europe is um, one to build on prosperity and security and peace. And uh, we are a little bit afraid about uh, Russia. And I think we don't want to give uh, very strong information um, because we want to avoid a war. Yeah. We are afraid. <laughs> we are afraid because uh, if you see what Putin said, he talk about nuclear attack, it's stupid. And we are very afraid about that. I think you have also, if you want to understand the uh, European Union media, you have to also understand that we are afraid of a war against Russia. And that's a key issue for me. Isn't that uh, why in his recent interview with the ex-president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, the BBC uh, journalist uh, said that he made the statement that there is civil war going in Ukraine. Isn't that because what you said, it's easier for the journalist to name the conflict as a civil war rather than try to figure of out of course of course because you want, if, you, if you want to say in the bbc or a big uh, french channel russia is attacking ukraine then everybody everybody's gonna go what we will do what we will bomb. do now what we will do after that we have to go to war what we will do well, but this the is the problem. The word is very important. And the civil war is a civil war. That means it's anterior policy. Well, I, I, would, I, would, I would take issue with some of that. I think that the, it was a very important um, comment that the BBC, the G BBC journalist made there, very controversial. My personal opinion there was it was, a, it was a form of compromise because the content of the interview was so humiliating for, for <laughs> yeah, Yanukovych. Yeah, totally <laughs> Frankly, he was, made to just, look, well, he was made to look so stupid. A nice comedy. And I think that the way they did it was to say, oh, come on, we are balanced. We're not just trying to make Yanukovych look stupid because that would, by, by association, be anti-Russian. Mm -hmm. We say, we're not just trying to be anti-Yanukovych. We're also going to put something in that's in favor of your to, narrative to, to, to create, again, this sense of balance. Because the BBC doesn't have a policy of calling it a civil war. Um, they very often call it other things. Um, and I think I'd like to come back to the point you made there about the, the words being important, you know, the weight, the weight of words. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when this, when this crisis began, uh, the terminology that was most often used was, were, were things like Ukrainian rebels. Ukrainian separatists, mm -hmm. anti-Kiev, this sort of terminology. Then it became pro-Russian, mm -hmm. so a little bit closer. And now we went for the last perhaps um, six months or so, and it's something that I've been very much using in my own publications, Russian-backed. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're not saying they are all Russians. I think there's a rec you know, there, is, there, there needs to be a recognition that there are significant numbers of local individuals involved in this, in this uprising. Um, but the term, so that's the, 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 the evolution of terminology is moving towards a recognition that this is a Russian, uh, a Russian run operation, Russian backed, Russian run, Russian orchestrated. Mm -hmm. So we've seen the evolution. I think the civil war term is extremely um, powerful and extremely dangerous from yeah. a point of view of regional security. We talk about yeah. regional security yeah. and being afraid. Well, if, if this is a civil war, uh, then why can't we have a similar civil war in Estonia or Lithuania or Latvia or Kazakhstan or Moldova? That's a dangerous tendency. It's a very yes. dangerous tendency. And if, if, the, if the Kremlin sees that the Western media has accepted this line of argument that it is a civil war, that will be a very, very strong green light for them to go further in Ukraine and elsewhere. Yeah. Well, it's... Uh, it is a, a real pleasure to have you here at uh, our show. I would like for the two of you to give uh, final statements about the freedom of press here in Ukraine and um, uh, just anything you want to add. 
Um, well, first of all, I think that the, the, it's very important what you're doing, that you're trying to put out information in English to the audience. I think that's very uh, useful, and there needs to be a lot more of these sort of initiatives that people need to know Ukraine. As I mentioned at the very start of our show, uh, I don't think that there's a very strong anti-Ukrainian sentiment anywhere in the world. I don't get that impression. I think there is indifference and a lack of information. So the way to counter that is to put out the, the, the truth about Ukraine and also to show the, the many sides of Ukraine, to let people become familiar and get to mm -hmm. know Ukraine because it's a wonderful country. Uh, we shouldn't engage in propaganda. We need okay. to simply open Ukraine up to the world. That's exactly what yes. you've been we, talking we, to. We, yes. we need Your final we, statements. We need to open Ukraine to the rest of the world and we need to talk only about the facts, what's happened, what's happened only. And I am very optimistic for the future of Ukraine. And uh, I like uh, the parallelism between uh, Kiev and London during the Second World War. <laughs> <laughs> Town of Liberty. Let's, <laughs> let's make that as a final thought. We hope that Ukraine is going to be uh, it's it, at the threshold of something new. And the whole world and Europe will probably learn something too from what is happening here. They could very well. Yeah. All right. All right. It was United Country UAT time by First Ukraine. Olivier Vedrin and Sergei Velichansky were working for you in the studio. Stay with us and we will show you the real Ukraine. Thank you for being with us. Have a good day and see you soon.